Today in our presentation we're going to look at what Jesus said about baptism. There are many different ways and many different churches that all baptise differently. But what does the Bible say? What does Jesus teach? How should we be baptised? We're now going to open the Word of God and see what Jesus said about baptism. If you were to knock on the door of a dozen different churches and ask about baptism, you could easily receive a dozen different answers. One church may say, well, we baptise three times face forward. Another church may say, well, we practise baptism by pouring. We pour a little water on the person. Another church might say, we practise infant baptism by sprinkling. Another one may say, well, our method of baptism is by immersion one time. Another church may say we practice baptism by the laying on of hands, and some may say that they use a few drops of oil. Another church may tell you that they baptise with a little bit of salt. There's another church that will baptise you anywhere you want to be baptised. Another church practises the baptism of desire. That's just the fact that you want to be baptised, that's all that's necessary. And in the USA and Hollywood, they have even baptised a person with rose petals. So you see there are many, many ideas about baptism. But what does the Bible say we need to do? We need to peel away any preconceived ideas that we have and open our hearts and our minds and see what the Word of God has to say about it, about what he says should take place at baptism. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and baptise in his name and we see this all through the New Testament. Peter replied, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Christ gave a command that his disciples were to go out, and they were to baptise people in his name, and when they did that, then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It continues on in Mark and says this, He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So the Bible places great importance on it, it says that the individual who believes and is baptised will be saved, and it continues. Philip has been preaching in Samaria, and he makes it clear that we should be baptised. But when they believe Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptised. So these people heard the message. They heard what Philip had to say, and it says that as they accepted Jesus Christ, they were baptised. And God has given us instructions as to how this should take place. He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now baptism itself won't save you. A person has to believe. It says he who believes and is baptised will be saved. So baptism is very important. In fact, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, a Pharisee one night, and he said these words. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When it says it except that a person is born of water, it is referring to baptism. Unless he is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. God puts great, great importance on being baptised. So let's see what the scripture says about individuals being baptised and how that takes place. Peter puts this importance on it. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here Peter makes a comparison. In verse 20 of 1 Peter 3, it talks about the flood. It says how those people stepped out in faith, they got into the ark by faith. Up until that time it had never rained, but it was through faith that God brought them over to the new world. The old world had been destroyed by the flood, and it brought them into the new one. So it's talking about when a person is baptised by faith, it moves him to a new experience with Christ. It puts great importance on the fact that you and I need to follow the Lord in baptism. Some people say, well that's fine, but how am I supposed to be baptised? Is this some way, some method that the scripture teaches concerning baptism? People study their Bibles different ways. Some people mark their Bible, some people underline them or write in the margin. But if you underline, I want to give you some words to look at concerning baptism that show us there is only one way. 
Now John also was baptizing in Ainon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now it says that John was baptizing in Ainon near Salem, because there was much water there. The picture you are looking at is the Jordan, but don't think the Jordan is that big all the time, because it's not. I used to think that the Jordan was a great huge river because of songs like Roll Jordan Roll, and I had this picture that it was a great big river, but there are places where you can step across the Jordan, so it's not always a big river. But John was baptizing in this place because there was plenty of water there. So baptism requires much water. The scripture tells us about the baptism of Jesus and it's his example we should follow. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So it says that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan and it says, as he came up out of the Jordan. So to come up out of would mean that he had been immersed under the water. Probably one of the clearest examples in all of the Bible on baptism is the one found in the book of Acts concerning Philip. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Now this man was a believer in God, that's why he's in Jerusalem. He's there for the purpose of worshipping, and he's now on his way back home to Ethiopia. So here he is, riding along in his chariot, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet. And it says that whilst he's doing that, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So he stops the chariot, and the two of them are riding along, and now Philip is going to explain to him what he is reading in Isaiah. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now this man is reading Isaiah 51 to 53, but he doesn't fully understand what he's reading, so Philip explains the meaning of the scriptures to him. Now this man believes in God, and faith takes hold as he understands what Philip is saying. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No question, he accepts Jesus in full faith. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And now you have one of the best examples of baptism in all the scripture. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. They stopped the chariot. It doesn't say that Philip stayed on the shore. It says that both he and the eunuch got into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. It says they both went down into the water, and Philip baptises him. It makes it very, very clear. The Greek word for baptise is baptizo, which means to be put under. So when it says that Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and he baptised him, in Greek, it means to be put under. So the scripture is absolutely clear as to the manner, the way in which a person is to be baptised. It makes that very clear. What does baptism mean to you and me? Well, this gives us an idea of what it means. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. 
Then he allowed him. Jesus has come to John the Baptist and said, John, I need to be baptised. And John said, Lord, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes, let alone baptise you. But Jesus said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. Talking about baptism. Did Jesus need to be baptised? Did Jesus need to have his sins washed away? No, he was baptised as an example. You may say, well, wasn't the example of the disciples good enough? Why did Jesus need to be baptised? Why did he say to John, John, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness? Well, you see, the scripture tells us clearly what baptism represents. It has a very definite meaning. In the book of Romans, it has this to say about baptism. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? So it tells us that baptism represents the death of Jesus Christ. As the person is baptised, as he is placed beneath the water, it represents his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It not only represents the death of Jesus Christ, it also represents his burial. That's what it says, we are buried with him. As the person is placed beneath the water, it represents the burial of Jesus Christ. It continues and says that it also represents the resurrection. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism represents the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It also represents something in our experience. You see, when I'm baptised, it represents the death to the old man of sin. That's what it represents. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I, but Jesus Christ lives in me. You see, it represents the death of the old man of sin. It represents that all my sins have been buried, buried and cast into the depths of the sea. And it represents the resurrection, that I come out of the water totally clean of all my sins, resurrected to a new life with Jesus Christ. What a marvellous promise this is, and this is what baptism means and what it represents. That's why Jesus told John, permit it to be so, John, to fulfil all righteousness. It also says here that baptism is a public declaration of my acceptance of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. I am publicly declaring to the world that I have accepted Jesus Christ. The Bible makes a comparison between baptism and marriage because that's what marriage is. It's a public declaration of your life to another individual. That's why you have a marriage ceremony because it shows that you are publicly committing your life to that person. Baptism is our public declaration of acceptance to Christ. Let's look at some more examples in scripture. Peter is preaching and he is telling them that they crucified the Lord. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, they were cut to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent of what you have done. If you are truly sorry and you want to start a new life and follow Christ, then repent and be baptised. Make a public declaration that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Saviour. Here's another scripture. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians here and believed and were baptised. So baptism is simply a commitment of our life to Jesus Christ. It's a public declaration of our acceptance of Jesus. But some people say, well, what about my children? Or what about my baby? Or my baby that died before it was baptised? Now remember, Jesus said to John, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. That's one of the reasons Jesus was baptised. He was baptised for those people like the thief on the cross who never had the opportunity or for the soldier in the foxhole that was killed but who gave his heart to the Lord and never had a chance to be baptised. 
for that person that accepts Christ on his deathbed but has never had the opportunity to be baptised. For the child who was not old enough, Jesus was baptised and that's why he said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. The baby is perfectly safe in the hands of Jesus and when it becomes old enough to understand, then it should make a decision to follow Christ and be baptised. So we see that baptism has a very definite meaning in our lives according to scripture. When should I be baptised? Maybe I should wait two or three years. Do I need to study for a while before I'm baptised? But let's see what the scripture says. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, has been converted on the road to Damascus. The light has shone on him and knocked him to the ground. He has said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice has spoken to him and said, I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted. And he said, What do you want me to do, Lord? And he has to be led by the hand blind to Damascus. Now Jesus has also spoken to a man by the name of Ananias. And he said, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight, and I want you to find Saul of Tarsus, and I want you to pray for him, that he will receive his sight. And Ananias went there and prayed for him, and when he had finished praying for him, he said these words to him. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ananias said, Paul, don't wait any longer. Get up from here and go and be baptised. Make a public declaration of your acceptance of Jesus Christ. You see, there are no long-term baptisms in the Bible. You can't find one, not one. Do you remember when Paul and Silas were over in Philippi? They had been beaten and put in jail. They are chained, and it's about midnight. And you know what they're doing? They're singing. And there's an earthquake, and it rattles the doors, and the doors open, and the windows open, and the chains fall off their arms. The jailer thought that all the prisoners had escaped, and that he would lose his life for losing them. But Paul says, Don't do any harm to yourself, we are all here. And the jailer comes in, and falls down before them. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptised. In other words, as a person accepts Jesus Christ as their personal saviour, they can be baptised. Another time when Paul was preaching, we find Then those who gladly received his word were baptised, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them. You see, the Bible teaches that when we commit our life to Jesus Christ, we are to follow him in baptism. Baptism is not graduation. It is not when it's all over, it's where we begin. Baptism is where you begin your walk with Jesus Christ. That is what it represents, what it means. Baptism is something you and I are to experience if we've accepted Jesus. If you were baptised some other way than the scripture teaches, then you need to be rebaptized. Maybe you were baptised when you were very young, so young that you didn't know what you were doing. But now you are in the place where you can make your own decision. Now you understand, so you need to be rebaptized. There may be some of you that had accepted Jesus, but then you've gone off and not followed the Lord. You've walked away from God, and maybe not followed him for a long time. And now you're coming back. You have recommitted your heart to the Lord. Then you ought to be baptized again. It says that when you accept him into your heart, and you make that public declaration to him and to the world, then he will wash away all your sins and make you whiter than snow. God is giving you that opportunity of starting over, of having a new life, and Jesus will wash the slate absolutely clean and make you whiter than snow. Make sure you are ready for his kingdom. Thank you.